yeah, in our tour, uh, we could access the halls only during the night. We could not afford to buy, for example, a day in Musikverein or a day in Berlin Philharmonie. So that way we can replicate the kind of the sound, spatial sound field that you have in a concert hall. We want to compare the halls to understand what are the differences between the halls. We kind of take the same seat in each hall and then jump from hall to hall and then compare how different they are. What makes a great concert hall? In my opinion, it's, it's really Welcome to High Point. I always say hi, but it's a bit stupid because we've been talking for half an hour. Can I ask you to introduce yourself uh, the way you would like to be introduced? Yeah, I'm uh, Tapio Lokki. Uh, I'm professor in, in acoustics in Alta University. I started my studies here in 1990 and did my master's in, in 97 and PhD in 2002. And since then, I was I had a couple of different researcher and teaching positions. And then since 2012, I've been professor. Currently, we have four professors, about 30 to 40 people in the lab, PhD students, master students, doing all kind of research. Uh, mainly the main area is, is audio DSP related things, uh, but and 3D sound, uh, 3D sound capturing and uh, recording techniques, and then also reproduction, and then related psychoacoustics to that kind of spatial hearing related psychoacoustics. Obviously, the audience of High Point is not just made of acousticians, so um, we can't speak too technical. And we'll have to speak in layman's terms, and you know this, but yep. I'm just reminded. Um, how did you get into acoustics? Yeah, I played clarinet when I was young. Actually, for when I was in, in school and high school, I played football every day. Football was for everything for me. But then at the same time, I played clarinet. And then I was almost like quitting playing when I was 14, almost 15 years. But then there was a new orchestra, which became like the National Youth Orchestra, which was funded. And I went to the first rehearsal. And then I realized that, okay, this is something that I want to do, like playing in a, in a symphony orchestra. And that was also basically my dream job. Luckily, I was clever enough that that uh, I decided that I'm not I'm not pursuing in this direction because I realized that, that there are there are only a few positions in in Finland. We have a handful of orchestras, and then they have always like two to four clarinet positions, and they are opened when somebody retires. So there is, there are not so, so many positions. And then then I decided that yeah, because math and physics was quite easy in high school, I went to technical university. And then uh, I went to the electrical engineering, and then I had a, also a little bit of, of kind of idea of, of studying acoustics, and that, that was mainly that why I went to electrical engineering, because I knew that the acoustics lab is, is, is in this department. There was actually a brass orchestra, which includes clarinets and, and percussion instruments uh, in the student union. And that was one of my main motivations to, to enter this, this university because the, that's kind of quite famous and, and why I wanted to play there. So that was one motivation. And the other motivation was that, that like technical field was, was interesting. But then during the studies, kind of I, I took a couple of, of acoustic courses and, and realized that this is my field. Great. The way I got into acoustics was fairly similar, similar age but it was at the music school and I was really fed up all the theoretical courses, but I needed one or two years longer to get a diploma or to try to pass a diploma. And uh, to keep me motivated, the director of the, uh, the school said, you know, there's those jobs where you can design a concert hall and therefore you need a diploma to show that you're, you're a musician and you know you can speak their language as well of orchestra conductors. So... That kept me motivated, but so to be an acquisition, but it didn't keep moti me motivated enough to uh, finish that diploma. But I guess I, I've never been asked any music diplomas. I'll go straight into the main topic of that podcast uh, episodes. What makes a great concert hall? In my opinion, it's it's really uh, currently it's that how the concert hall actually responds to what orchestra is playing. It's really that does the concert hall kind of emphasize, for example, the dynamics that the orchestra is playing. So that if they're playing in pianissimo, is it, is it silent? Is it quite silent? And then when they are playing fortissimo, is it kind of so that, that you hear the sound, so that it's loud enough, but then it's also that it's kind of maybe 
even overwhelming and, and, and surrounding you. I love big orchestras and composers like Mahler and Sostakovich and Sibelius and, and, and these kind of composers and then also symphonies like that. And then you can imagine that, okay, there are really loud parts and, and then they have to be loud enough for me. Do you still practice or play music, I presume, yes? Are you still a member of an orchestra? Not really. Not really. There is no... It's a little bit of lack of motivation because it's it's to play the clarinet, you actually have to have the muscles in, in your face which are in condition, so you, you should actually play every day. And then the level I got when I played is is kind of... It's not really high, but it's it's something already that 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 if I want to reach the same level where I was, I, I should actually play every day. Yeah, it's, it's similar. And I blame it on my kids um, who always want to get involved when I play and not get involved nicely, but more uh, break the instruments or just smash the instruments. So, yeah, it's, it's really hard to keep going. And it, if you stop for a number of years, it's really hard to get back into your old levels, as you say, and get back and yep. uh, show people, members of a band or an orchestra that you're good enough. Yeah, so back to a concert hall, uh, the, your ideal concert hall. It's it's quite interesting because obviously concert hall, there's the priority of a good acoustics and all the designers um, work towards this. But when on more like multi-purpose spaces, you find that acoustics is just a nice to have, but there's more priority on the rest and you come more as an expense maker than somebody to solve a problem. We're going to talk about sound reverberation, obviously, um, and the importance of lateral reflections. As we said before, you've, you've given me some homework and I did some reading before that episode. Uh, I don't know everything exactly, but I'm trying to, uh, to follow. How do you introduce sound reverberation to your students? Yeah, kind of reverberation is, is what we have in, in every room. If you take a little bit broader context than only concert halls, it's kind of people always ask that, okay, is this good room or is this good reverberation or something? And I, I usually say that there's no bad or good. It's, it's kind of, it has to be so that the reverberation supports what is the purpose of the space. So if, if you have a library, that should be quite silent. Or if you have a classroom, there should be a little bit of reverberation so that actually the teachers can speak without kind of losing their voice. But of course, it should be quite dry so that there is not much noise what, what the students are doing. And then then when we go to concert halls, of course, we need more reverberation because kind of the how I introduce usually reverberation in concert halls is that the reverberation is kind of the glue in music. So it ties phrases together. It kind of gives you a feeling of space. And, and, and then uh, it's really... It's needed in, in music, uh, that the music flows. Then, of course, if we go to the like more details, it's kind of what kind of reverberation we have. And then we go to the different frequencies. So is it is there enough bass, for example? Is there enough high frequencies so that we have enough like brightness? And then it's also like the spatial aspects that do we feel that the reverberation is... There is enough reverberation, so the kind of music sounds nice, but is it on, on stage only? So when... It's, is it only in front of you or is it really surrounding you so that you can feel that you are inside the music in a way? Sabine was at the origin of the findings of the room acoustics science. Do you know how it evolved from Sabine to, to now? What sort of tools he was using to measure the sound reverberation? Yeah, what Sabine did is, is was basically just exciting rooms with with, I think it was organ by pipes that there was only like one frequency at the time and then then measuring how long he could still hear when he stopped uh, the, the sound, how long he could still hear the sound and then having a, a stopwatch and really manually like doing and then understood that okay the, the rooms actually resonate or kind of the vibration is there. But since then I think it has been I don't know the history exactly. There is also some literature that it was also before that people understood the re a little bit of, of reverberation and, and a little bit of rooms. But since then, I think the reverberation, it's kind of the measurement techniques has been evolved at how we can measure, we can clap our hands. But nowadays, it's with signal processing, we can do much more advanced techniques using 
for example, sine sweeps or something, and then mathematically do them as an impulse so that we can get the impulse response, what is an important concept. But then it was like roughly 50 years, 55 years ago, when, when there was kind of this kind of spatial aspects came to play. I think it was Marshall and, and then Baron who basically wrote the first papers on kind of the, the lateral reflections and spatial aspects that, that we can actually have also reflections from the side which are beneficial and then also this kind of enveloping reverb which is around you. How were they measure, measuring the, uh, the natural reflections? They used two microphones. The one was figure of eight so that there's kind of the it's kind of to the side and then the null is pointing actually to the stage and then the other one is omni and then they compare that that what is kind of the ratio of figure of eight and omni microphone and and by this way you can you can hear a little bit of or you can see a little bit that, that what is kind of the, the how much there's a lateral component in the sound field but it was not really accurate at that time then they actually kind of replicate really simple soundscapes in in laboratory so that in an anechoic space, they had like several loudspeakers and one of them was in front and that was like the direct sound. And then on the side, they have a couple of other loudspeakers where they have a little bit delayed sound, which means that kind of uh, modeling the reflection. And by this way, understood a little bit how we hear these, these uh, reflections. But then I think it, it took like quite a long time and, and only recently, like a couple of, let's say, 20 years back, we have had multi-microphone systems where we can really analyze that, that where the sound is coming from in which different time frames. So you mentioned about those um, putting different loudspeakers at different places. What sort of systems do you use? Because obviously <laughs> you explain in your in your book that to improve the research on concert halls and the perceptions of different sounds coming from di- different directions or reflections coming from different directions, it's better to record the reverberation of concert halls and then reproduce them by with some processing uh, in those sorts of systems so we can compare very quickly the uh, or get the subjects exposed to uh, different sound conditions. Can you explain a little bit what sort of system you use? Yes, yes. So, uh, so traditionally, like the, uh, the first ref- first studies that were done like 50 years ago, were really that 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 because at that time there was no like digital audio yet. It was more or less like like tapes and and, and recordings. And then they could have like anechoic recording, so recorded in a really dry space. And then you can have like, okay, you have a one sound in front of you, one loudspeaker, and there you have the direct sound, and then delayed copies of that. Maybe delay, I think, was was, was already there, or there you just have a pick and different pick up points from your tape. Then a few reflections. But of course, that was that was kind of the idea, try to model a little bit of the sound environment in a concert hall. Because in a concert hall, we have thousands of reflections. Then just kind of simplifying that. But what, what we have done is that we measure the concert halls, the impulse responses of the concert halls. So we have a loudspeaker on stage, which is emitting. We use sign sweeps, but then the, it's equivalent that there will be one impulse. So you can think a clap of hand. Then so you have an impulse, and then of course you hear the decay of, the, of this impulse. And then we have a multi-microphone system. There have to be at least four microphones. We are using six, but four is the minimum. And they are omni-microphones. And then based on the time differences between the microphones, so if, if I, I don't know if you see here, but for example, if I have three microphones here and there's a plane wave coming in one direction, there is a tiny time differences when they hit the microphones. And those tiny time differences we can find with mathematical terms. It's, it's called cross-correlation. We can find out what is kind of the the time difference between the microphones when you have an impulsive sound, so you have peak there. And based on that, if you have multiple, more than four microphones, then you have enough microphone pairs to have big number or bigger number of, of these, these different delays. And then you can estimate that where actually the sound is coming. And that you can do also in, in tiny windows through the whole signal. And, and then you can find out in different time frames that where the sound is coming or where these impulses are coming. And kind of the first impulse is, of course, from the stage, that, that's the direct sound. And then later on, there's another impulse, which is actually coming to the reflection. It can be from the ceiling or from the side wall or something. Then this, this microphone array analyzes these, these directions. 
So traditionally in an impulse response, there is only the pressure value. So we have the pressure of the signal, which are these peaks and valleys in the, in the signal. But now in addition to that, we have also a side information <clears throat> that where every single sample is coming. So in a way we have kind of a space, what we call spatial impulse response. And that we use in our reproduction. Currently we have 45 loudspeakers around you. So it's kind of that you are surrounded by the loudspeakers. And then we can divide this one impulse response, which is from Omni microphone. So we know that the quality is really good from Omni mi microphone. And because we have this side information, we can actually distribute these reflections because we, we can analyze individual reflections. And then we distribute them in these uh, 45 loudspeakers so that they are coming in the correct direction in a correct time. So that way we can replicate the kind of the sound, spatial sound field that you have in a concert hall. And that's, of course, done only for the impulses. But then there is a mathematical operation called convolution that we can use then to convolve it with anechoic or dry recording. And by this way, you can add, add the signal there, there as well. So this is for one sound source. But in a symphony orchestra, of course, you have from 50 to 100 players. So you should have actually 50 to 100 sound sources. So that means that you have to replicate this for 50 to 100 times uh, moving your loudspeaker in uh, on stage. But we end up of, of having like we build like the loudspeaker orchestra. So we build orchestra out of loudspeakers. So we distribute the different measurement like loudspeakers on stage sitting as, as orchestra would sit. And then currently we are in our system, we have 32 loudspeakers, which are actually connected to 24 channels. But then we have 24 of these spatial impulse responses. And then it corresponds to different instruments. And then that's why we can then replicate this process for every single instrument, basically, or small instrument. It's quite technical, but I hope that somebody could follow this. So the end result is that, that when you are sitting in, in our listening room, which is a, a dry space, and then all these 45 loudspeakers around you, basically you hear the kind of the orchestra playing on stage, and you have an impression that the orchestra is in front of you, playing on stage, and then you hear the reverberation where it comes from. The crucial point here is that, of course, we could actually record a real orchestra with spatial sound recording, which is possible nowadays. But then when we go to the next hall, because the key point is that, that we want to compare the halls to understand what are the differences between the halls, is that the orchestra is not playing actually the same way in each hall, because that's the beauty of the orchestra is, is kind of uh, play the horse differently because if, if it's too dry hole or or something that they they play differently that's their job kind of accommodate their playing style to the acoustics of the hall then we cannot guarantee that ex it's exactly the same level we cannot guarantee that the tempo is exactly the same and so on but when we when we do this with this measured responses and this loudspeaker orchestra what we call loudspeaker orchestra it's kind of loudspeaker simulator then those we can calibrate and we can guarantee that they are exactly the same level and exactly in the same positions in each hall, like they are sitting in exactly on the same spots. And then our anechoic recordings is also, also like it's one recording and, and we use the same recording. So that ends up that we have kind of the calibrated orchestra. You need to say what anechoic is. Yeah, anechoic is, is as dry as possible. So it's 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 dry recording. You can think yeah. that it's it's recorded in a dry studio, for example. With no ver no reverberation, no reverberation. Yeah, no reverberation. So so it's it's kind of because we are adding the reverberation to these responses. It all started by thinking that okay, if we want to study concert halls, we have to minimize the variables that they are in our studies. And then the biggest one biggest variable is, is orchestra, because they are humans playing and moving and, and this kind of thing. So they actually and they change their playing style and so on. So we want to fix this variable so that it's it's not changing. And that led to the idea of, of, of building kind of a symphony orchestra simulator. And then, of course, the microphone array is, is another thing that, okay, it's the microphones, it acts exactly the same way. We can calibrate the levels and so on. So we fix everything. And then what where we are doing these, these measurements is, is exactly also that's kind of fixed, like the distances. So when we did our tour 10 years ago, uh, we fixed the distances so that it's always like 7, 11, 15, 19, and 23 meters from the from the loudspeakers, from the closest loudspeakers, so that we kind of take the same seat in each hall. And then now in the laboratory, when we have when we are listening these 
these uh, reproductions. We can really take a position from 15 meters from the orchestra and then jump from hall to hall and then compare how different there are. For kind of easy differences is a loudness difference. Some hall are just louder than the others. And then if you have exactly the same distance, calibrated orchestra, calibrated microphone system, calibrated reproduction system, then you can, if there is a loudness difference, then it's something that the hall does. How do you do a measurement campaign? And I presume also if you do some measurements one year, you may have some missing, missing information that some people will need in five, ten years' time. So they'll have to go back and do other measurements. Is there a d database online that uh, of people who have done measurements and that can be used for more acoustic research? Unfortunately, not our... our uh, we have been thinking of, of kind of putting it online, but it's kind of so much data. Now it's actually possible, but ten years ago it was too much. But there are some, some other... Nowadays there are also some other... Uh, studies which have the similar ones. Our anechoic recordings, so these dry recordings, they have been available for, for free since 2008 when we did them. But how we actually guarantee that we don't have a missing data or something, it's it's something that we did already in earlier, before our tour in Central Europe. We did many halls in, in Finland, and then we kind of developed the, the whole symphony simulator or the loudspeaker, also loudspeaker positions, their orientation so that they match as well as we can, like the directivities of the instruments. And then, then we kind of tested it, it many times. And then in this tour, we went there, we have really strict procedure, how we did. We actually kind of copied a little bit what the pilots are doing in airplanes. They have this kind of checklists. And then we had, we had also this kind of checklist that, that when we set up everything, we calibrate everything, then one guy went to the, like the condu conductor podium and, and checked that. Is every single loudspeaker on? Is every single on and, and every wire on? And then this so that that we are not missing data. And then we, then we of course we kind of measured first, and then we analyzed quickly. First impulse responses we measured, and we, then we analyzed them quickly in situ there. That okay, are there any noises? Sometimes we actually found ultrasound noises or something else that there were some problems, and then, and then that we have a clean and good signal. And then we kind of in situ there spend like one hour for, for testing everything so that we are, we guarantee that, that, that the data is correct. And then we just actually recorded the sweeps for multiple places. How long does it take to do a measurement or a set of measurements or campaign of measurements in a single hall? I presume it takes a few days. Uh, no, it was, it was actually limited to eight hours because oh, okay. uh, in a, yeah, in our tour... Uh, we could access the halls only during the night. Oh yeah, of because course. We, yeah, we, we, we could not we could not afford to buy, for example, a day in Musikverein or a day in Berlin Philharmonie. And then the only way was was that that uh, when we got kind of contact to the management of the halls, that and we said that can we come in like after let's say 10 p.m. after the concert or after the, the day whatever there is, and then so that we are out before seven or eight when the like the first rehearsal persons or <laughs> first rehearsal start or something and and then then that was like the easiest way to get access to these halls then we actually how we then went is that we rented the nightliner the same kind of bus that the rock bands are doing so that there are beds in bus bus and so on and so, so we always did our work in in uh, during the night and then went to the bus to sleep and then the bus driver Goes to the next city, but it was it was designed so that that the setup was actually two hours. So we have a we, we were six uh, six researchers, and then we had a clear role of of everybody. One was setting up the microphone, a couple of them of setting up the loudspeakers and and putting the wires. Always the same person was doing the same thing, so that it's it's kind of it was smooth. Then this kind of testing checklist thing, testing everything, and then then we always listened uh, half an hour. We had these anechoic recordings, but because, of course, you can play them from the loudspeakers in situ. So we listened to them so that everybody could walk around the hall and make notes and, and how, how you have kind of the, you have the oral impression also in situ. And then after these two hours, uh, sometimes it, it went three hours if there were some problems. And then, then we know that, okay, we are ready. And then we had to clear that we want to have at least these five positions and then a couple of them. And then first row of the balcony. So we had seven, eight positions, like recording positions or seats, 
which you wanted to have from every hall. And if then there were time in the end, then we took some extra positions. But it was really designed so that everything can be done in, in eight hours. There's always, in those sorts of projects, there's always like 10 or 20 percent technical or actual, actually scientific and the rest is all logistics and organizations and yeah. operations. I know it's been popular, uh, like Mike Barron uh, wrote a book about uh, and summarized all his measurements and analysis as well. Are you Have you got any plans to do some something similar about concert halls in Finland? Yes, yes, but it's kind of, uh, yes, I have had a long time But of course, uh, we have done a lot of scientific publications like journal articles and so on. And then that's actually a little bit problematic because the information is actually scattered to, to different publications. And then, then I have had an intention almost 10 years to write a book, but I'm still hesitating to start it because I know that it's at, at least two years stress on top of everything. I'm now a professor and then, of course, there are daily, daily duties, so it will be weekends and and evenings and nights when I should write it. And then I'm hesitating to start it because I, I know that it's it's several years of... I should take, take a sabbatical and then probably write it. That that would be probably the, <laughs> the easiest way to do it. I thought the the book you gave me, or the chapter of the book you gave me to read, yeah. was just talking about two concert halls. And there was a lot of an analysis that you don't see that much in other books uh, or the books I've read. So it would be really rich for any other designers to have that sort of analysis on 10, 20 concert halls so we can compare them. And if we know that we've got a database of um, impulse responses, we could even use them. But I guess it's, you have to spend a lot of money and people are keeping that data. Yeah, and the literature on, on concert halls is kind of Uh, it's kind of biased, I think, a little bit of, of Beronex books because they, they are basically, okay, there is the basic information and, and, and really good information, but then it's really like big number of halls, like the uh, pictures, architectural drawings, some technical data. And then uh, it's kind of the form that people think that that's kind of the book of, of concert halls. I think Mike Barron's book is, is, is the only one which is really like meant for designers that, that there are some design uh, ideas and it's kind of explaining different things like this. Okay, maybe there will be some, or there are some other books, but also there are many books which, they are more like cookbooks a little, a little bit like this, that, that you have a, many different halls and then people are, consultants are looking them and, and looking at, okay, yeah, this, this looks like this and this looks like this and then the technical data is this. It's kind of maybe uh, having like a, uh, many pictures of horse so that people get some new ideas out of these. And it's, it's not really like explaining, let's say, basic theories and perceptual issues that, that has been mainly our, our research focus. Let's talk about natural reflections. Why are they so important? We know we try to, when we work on, on projects, we try to make people understand that they're really important. Therefore, their design needs to be focused on getting more reflections or sound reflected from the surfaces, side surfaces, back to the side of the uh, the audience. Can you describe a little bit more the, the background of that, those findings and that research? And there's still some research that carries on. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of, I think the easiest, easiest way kind of uh, with the layman terms to understand is that, that we have two ears, which are on the different sides of the head. So if the sound is coming in front of you or back of you or above you, like from the ceiling, it's the same sound in, in both ears because it's kind of basically coming in the middle. But then when the sound is coming from the side, there's a small difference between the ears. There's a small time difference, and then there's also a small level difference because the sound has to diffract there, and, and it's, it's a little bit attenuated. Then what has been found is that, that okay, the direct sound is, is usually in front of you because that's where you are look, looking at, for example, orchestra. But then if the, if the first reflections which are coming are not from the ceiling, but they are from the side, then they kind of widen your perceived sound uh, field. And then they make it more interesting. It's kind of comparing mono and stereo. So it's kind of more stereo, but if you have a case that, that you have a direct sound in front of you and then ceiling reflection coming from the ceiling, 
uh, then it's kind of more monophonic. And then it, it's more stereo, stereo sound when you have kind of the side reflections. So that's kind of the, the easy way of, of understanding that, okay, there is some differences in where the sound is coming from. But recently we have also, or it, it, it was actually really old paper from 70s, I think in Germany, there was one psychoacoustic study that was done with speech where they found out that if there is a lateral reflection, then actually we, uh, like the threshold of hearing that, it's lower. So it can be even minus 15 dB lower than the direct sound that we can still hear the lateral reflection. But then in front of you or behind you or above you, it's only like 10 dB, then you don't hear it anymore. That's related to this, what I said, this kind of spatial aspects that, that, uh, and this kind of uh, dynamic aspect is that when the orchestra is not playing really loud, when it's playing silently, you probably don't hear any of these reflections so well. Of course, you hear some of them and they are giving you some feel of the space. But then, uh, then it's kind of the, the size of the orchestra that you hear is kind of something that what you see. And the impression, like the, spa- uh, like the oral impression is the same, that, okay, this is the orchestra, you can see the, the player who is playing in pianist somewhere, and that's, that's kind of the size. But if you have these lateral reflections, and then we, when the orchestra is playing louder, then we actually start to hear them. And we hear them actually earlier and, and better than, for example, these ceiling reflections. And they kind of enhance the, let's say, the play dynamics. A little bit. That's important in kind of it. It kind of widens your uh, auditory image, so that that sometimes in in some halls, I think everybody has. has uh, if you have been in several halls, in some halls you have you have kind of when the orchestra is playing loud, the sound is everywhere. It's not only on stage, but it's everywhere, and that's kind of one impression that you get from there. And then the, even though the lateral reflections are usually, we, we talk about the first reflections, so they are really like the first reflections. But I think when you have the lateral surf or the, the side surfaces which are reflecting sound, of course, it's also later in the reverberation. It's, they are giving you reflections because then the sound bounces from the walls several times and go back and forth. And then still in the end of the reverberation, kind of the later in the reverberation, you also have more lateral sound, which is actually causing better envelopment. So the sound and the reverb envelops you better. And that's also that if you have only like this kind of, let's say traditionally this, what we, what we call fan shape hall, is that, that you have the quite narrow audience area in, the, in front, but really wide in back. So the, the walls are really kind of tilted so that, that they are pushing the sound to the back of the hall. Then you don't have this envelopment so much in the end also. And that's kind of, you never get kind of buried inside the sound which is surrounding you. So there are not very good holes for acoustics. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it, it's kind of, uh, we can say that, yeah, they are not probably supporting so much and they are not so good. But on the other hand, some people like more dry acoustics and they don't like this this envelopment because then usually the, the other, other side of the coin is that usually the clarity is quite high in these holes. The clarity meaning that how well you can separate the instruments and then probably, in, for example, in contemporary music, it's important to hear like every single instrument really clearly. And then if you don't have a lot of reverb, it, if it's quite dry the whole, then it's, of course, it's, it's easier to kind of hear every single instrument. And that's something that some people want to hear. But nowadays, I think the golden target in concert hall design is, is to have this clarity. So is to have this really good separation of the instruments, but then still have quite a lot of reverb, which is enveloping you. And then... That's possible to do exactly with this, uh, these early lateral reflections and then high enough ceiling. And, and there are many, many, many architectural features which actually contribute to that, that, that we could have this kind of really clear sound so that, that you, can, you can clearly hear kind of all the tiny details in the, in the music, but still you are kind of embedded inside the music. You did some research. You you have a really interesting research paper on the ability of the orchestra to uh, communicate the feelings and emotions with uh, the help of uh, lateral reflections. Uh, I thought it was quite interesting, the approach and the way you uh, rated it. Can you describe it a little bit? Yeah, yeah, because we... uh Based on our these these measurements and these these oralizations and renderings in in our listening room, we noticed that in some halls actually when when there's a we had a 
one of our examples is, is, is in the beginning part of the Beethoven Seventh Symphony, where you have this kind of full orchestra crescendos, where they are just a couple of woodwinds first playing, but then the uh, the strings and, and the orchestra is, is playing this kind of raising chord, and, and then it's, it's kind of fortissimo in the end. So there's really nice big crescendos. And then uh, we heard and, and noticed that in some halls, actually, these crescendos seem to be bigger and larger. And then, then also what I explained, this, this kind of widening of the orchestra, it seems to happen in some halls, but in some halls, it's kind of the sound image stays in front of you, but in some halls, it's kind of, they are kind of the sound image is widening also at the same time. It's due to lateral reflections. And then we made a, we made a listening test that, that we found out that, yeah, perceptually people, that's what people find out. But then in the, uh, we were actually at that time in the Department of Media Technology, there was also uh, vision-related research, and they used skin conductivity response, which is used quite a lot in emotion research in, in many fields. And that means that there is kind of in, in two of your fingers, you put the device and it, then it is measuring basically the, uh, the electricity. So it's sending small electricity pulses from one finger to another. Then it's measuring that, that how much electricity is actually going between your two fingers. And then uh, if you get excited something, and if there's big emotions, then we are micro sweating or the temperature of your fingers raise a little bit or something. Something happens, but probably micro sweating is, is kind of the easiest to understand. And that means that the electricity actually there is more electric connect connection because you have some moisture and then there is more electricity going between your fingers. So that's kind of a way of, of measuring emotions. So we, we designed a listening test that we invited people to our listening room and they sat there silently and then we put these, these devices to their two fingertips. And then we played these, these crescendos in random order so that, that because there is, of course, it's kind of quite noisy measurement. And then there is also that you get used to this because it's always the same crescendo, just a small, tiny difference between the holes. But then if you randomize that between the subjects, then, then they do this kind of uh, biases out that people get used to it and, and your responses are not any, any more so big. But then based on this study, we have 28 subject in the end, subjects in the end. And then we find out that actually some of these shoebox, what we call shoebox holes, so where you have a lot of these lateral reflections, then these, these responses from your conductivity of electricity in, between your fingers, they were actually higher than, than in some other holes. And that was kind of one way of measuring how powerful the crescentos are or how, how big impact they make just to subjects. Of okay. course, we don't know if it's a negative or positive impact because it's it's only that <laughs> it's telling that you that that you have some feelings right? and you you kind of react to that. But of course, then we asked that was it positive or negative, and everybody said that yeah, it's it's just much bigger. And the whole sound like in musical terms, it sounds like more expressive. How did you come up with, or how did you find out that sort of uh, experiment could be done? With the fingers, it's kind of because we because we had the 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 vision the the guys who are doing the vision related research and they had the device uh, and then then we thought that yeah maybe we can test it also and and then then when we did a little bit of literature study study then it's it's it was obvious that okay that has been done and that has been used and nowadays there is there are many others people are doing heart rate measurements heart rate variability measurements. And there are also many others. Pupil size is, is one thing which is nowadays checked. And that that's kind of... In speech research, there's a, quite a lot of, of research when you have speech buried in noise and then you like, barely hear it, then it's, it's the pupil size is actually correlating that how much cognitive effort you have to put when you're trying to understand speech in noise. So there are nowadays, there are actually many of these kind of psychophysical measurement techniques to, to study different things but the, the the crucial point is also that you have to have the what what people are listening you have to have them in in good quality and then also that they are really replicating what is the real sound field so for example in our case that, that the concert horse really sound like the real concert horse because otherwise you're just listening something else there's a lot of work behind designing this and then this is kind of an extra measurement there's another topic, another topic I wanted to speak to you about or ask your opinion on the difference between vineyard and shoebox shape uh, console holes. There's um, 
as many of them. There's a big trend on vineyard console holes, but they lack of uh, lateral reflections more than shoebox shaped holes. And again, in that chapter, there was some really good analysis of it. So could you summarize your findings? Yeah, it's kind of, uh, and this is really from the audience point of view. We can discuss a little bit from the musician's point of view later on, because that's kind of a different story. But from the audience point of view, what we have found out and then, of course, there are like flavors in this in different vineyards and different shoe. Not all shoe boxes are really good. There's also some some which are not so good. But basically, the the difference how I describe it is is that uh, in a vineyard hall where the orchestra is, is in center center, and then basically the audience is surrounding, sitting on the almost on the walls of the hall. I would describe it that that we are always like looking at the music because basically it's kind of orchestra is down there. You can think also that they are many of these halls are, are if you look at the the section uh, drawings they are a little bit like a bowl. So the orchestra is sitting in the on the bottom of the bowl and then the the audience kind of on the walls of this bowl. And unfortunately, in most of these halls, like the the sound is always staying on stage and it's in front of you. As we are missing these lateral reflections, in in most of them, uh, we. We don't have this this kind of, and they are playing louder and, and so on. The hall is not so much excited and we don't have this kind of enveloping reverb. So it's kind of always, it stays in, in front of you, the auditory image. And that's why I'm, I'm calling them as, as looking at the music. But then in a, in a good shoebox hall where you have a lot of lateral reflections, high ceiling and maybe balconies, which are also giving you reflections, then you are much better enveloped by the music. So you are kind of inside the music uh, when the orchestra is playing and then because you have the enveloping surrounding reverb. And that's kind of the main difference between these. And of course, there are different flavors of, of these differences, but that's kind of what we have found out based on the halls that we have studied. And what's your prefer- preference as a listener? Um, Maybe it depends preference. on the style of the music, as you said before. Uh, yeah, a little bit, but I, I still prefer the shoebox holes and this kind of enveloping reverb because that's also what I explained about the dynamics and the dynamics responsiveness. The, the responsiveness to kind of dynamic changes in, in music and then pianissimos and fortissimos then they are usually also larger in this way. You have the lateral reflections, and so in these shoebox holes. And they are kind of mild in, in, in this vineyard holes. But then uh, that's purely sound. And then if you look at like the visual aspects, we are basically visual animals. So there I understand the vineyard holes quite well because it's kind of really people are gathering around the orchestra and, and the visual you see the orchestra pretty well, and then the impression is that 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 it's kind of it can be impression can be that even though there is like more than thousand people, that it's actually quite small the hall because the orchestra is in center, and then then everybody is close. Then it's also some people value that that you can see the orchestra from different directions. You can go behind the orchestra, even though the sound is is probably not so perfect, but you can see the, what the conductor is doing much better. But that's a different experience and, and kind of a different way of, of going to concerts. We acousticians usually think only like the sound, but then it's it's kind of, it's really like, okay, those people go there for because they want to, for example, see that what the orchestra is doing when they are playing. And, and then you can see much better, for example, behind the orchestra. And we always have to remember that that not all the concert goers are really huge fan of music. There are there are some spouses who are there only for like social <laughs> means means that they are it's kind of their weekly routine. They have a season ticket and and then one of them is actually really like enthusiastic of music, but the other one is that okay, it's okay. I, I like to listen to music, but but I'm I'm really the best part of the concert is is the intermission when where we see our friends and and, and we can have a glass of wine and. and and it's kind of festive event. And there is always this kind of audience as well. So we have really different aspects. And then if the architecture is really great and, and then there is also something to see and, and, and some other aspects, then those are also kind of aspects that, that that make a difference. I agree. And also some, not everybody, not all the audience will know every piece of music that the orchestra or the artist will 
will play. And at some point, yes, I agree. You forget about of, about the audio when you're close to the orchestra because obviously you want to see all the details, what they're doing, the way they're the playing. Uh, how fast they're moving, so you don't mind the trade-off. Another aspect still is is there is is kind of the musicians and conductors. So uh, that's also I see one of the reasons that there has been so many of these vineyard and, and this kind of surround halls is is especially conductors. They they are kind of big uh, big players who want to be in the center of the ac- action, and that's kind of their job. They have hundred people that they are guiding. And then also like a thousand people around them that they are watching them, basically watching them. Then if they are in the in the center point of the hall, that's kind of the easiest way of taking getting contact to audience because you have audience everywhere. And then that's probably also one of the reasons that that we have been seeing more of these kind of types of halls that that they kind of give the better uh, better connection to the musicians and the, the audience. And is the stage also better designed for acoustics? Obviously, there's the science of stage acoustics that has improved recently because of the all those reprodu- reproduction techniques. I think, I think, yes, yes. But then, yeah, one one uh, thing which I uh, still uh, want to point out here is that 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 the uh, the the one yard halls they actually have quite big difference between the seats. So if you are behind the orchestra, sound is actually quite different, and then it it might be hard to hear the soloist, which is especially singers, which are singing to another direction. And then on the side of the orchestra, it's, it's quite different on balconies. That might be interesting to somebody, not not if you have a season ticket that you're always sitting in the same, but but some people I know, for example, in Helsinki, we have such a hall and some people like to kind of sample the, the hall from, from different seats in different concerts. While in, in, in a in a that kind of classical shoebox hall, it's not the same sound, but it's kind of similar sound. The orchestra is in front of you always. And then, of course, if you're on a balcony, it's a little bit different. Or if you are back in the hall, there's more reverb than in front, or there's l- less direct sound, and then you kind of hear reverb more. But they, they the differences are, are smaller, usually. And that's kind of something that we have to kind of also understand that, that these are the differences as well. So... You've got some files or that or audio files you would like um, that we can hear about to hear some differences. Obviously, it's not perfect. If you have some headphones, by the way, you're listening to that uh, podcast. It's really advised to have some headphones, some fairly good ones. I've got some earphones, so they're not they're not perfect. There's also the importance of bass tapio that you've you've researched on. Yeah, yeah. So so in these samples, you you might hear a little bit of this this kind of the spatial aspects, but of course they are a little bit lost when we when we compute these for headphones, but, but still you might have some of these. But then uh, one thing that we have been studied, studying quite a lot is, is kind of the bass response of the hall, because that, that kind of gives you the warm feeling of, of like, we, we often call, call it like warmth or kind of the fundamentals of, of things. And, and then it gives you this kind of, broadness of sound when you have enough bass in a hall. And then that's related basically to seats. There are many aspects. Of course, it's kind of the wall materials and, and then stage, basically stage construction, which is, but one big aspect is the seats. And then uh, there's one PhD out of this, this studying different seats. And then what we have found out that if you have such a seat that it's actually what we call who call closed down there, so the sound cannot p- underpass the seats, then they act more like the bass traps, or they, they are actually reducing the bass in a hall. And, and bass, I mean now like below 100 hertz. So it's 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 really quite a low frequencies, but it's, it's really like the double basses, uh, tuba, maybe trombone and then percussion instruments like kettle drums and, and big drums. But if you have such, an, such a chair that, that there is an opening below the chair, so the sound actually can pass also below the chair, then usually you have actually boosted these this really low frequencies. And that's the, the effect is called the seat dip effect, which is basically, physically, you can think that, that you get the direct sound from the, from the stage, and then there is sound which is bending between the chairs and then reflecting from the floor. 
And then when, when it's coming up there again, then at certain frequency, it's in opposite phase and they cancel each other a little bit. And then you have a dip in your frequency response. And that's, of course, only one path. There are multiple paths. But then if you have this kind of chairs that you have like the, the backrest of the chair and then it goes down there, so you the sound actually can go only down and then it comes up because it cannot go below the chair. That kind of end up that, that you have this, this frequency which is attenuated. It's around 100 hertz, maybe 120, depending on the seat height. And then it also reduces like the lower frequencies a little bit. But then if, if you have this opening below and the sound actually can... It also diffracts down there, but then it's also it can, some some of that come up, but some of them go below the chair, and then there are like multiple paths. Then this what we call the C C deep frequency, where you have this attenuation, it actually goes octave higher, which is about two hundred hertz, and then you have actually kind of the positive summation at the really low frequencies, like below hundred hertz, and that's why you have much higher bass response. That's one of the one of the reasons for for like better bass response. You showed that that's um, effect uh, depends also on how inclined the floor is. Yeah, um, yeah, because it's it's the more you incline the floor, then of course there is less possibility that you have the opening there. Because even though yeah. you have the chair where you have small opening, but then if there is like the stepped stepped uh, raked uh, audience floor, then it blocks the sound by not yeah. going there. And that's uh, what we, if you come back to vineyard halls, is that's usually the case that, that it's kind of actually quite steeply, steeply raising the audience area. That's of course much better sidelines, but the, the other other way around is it's kind of, it's it's really uh, reducing the base. One way of explaining this is also that, that some people, maybe some of the the listeners are familiar with, with studios and, and, and diffusers and then room acoustics and diffusers. And then if you think about, for example, your studio or your small room where you do diffusers, then you usually have like maybe wooden beams or slats and then you have between them some gaps. And you are really targeting on high frequencies where the wavelengths are like, let's say, 10 centimeters or 20 centimeters. And then you can have this kind of wooden stripes then if you think about this kind of uh, audience block what you what you have in the for example in the vineyard hall at 100 hertz the wavelength is 3.4 meters so the wavelengths are really long and then you can also think that it's kind of a diffuser or base trap this kind of huge block of of seating rows and that's kind of one way of thinking that okay yeah it's actually acting the similar way than, than the diffusers on the wall at high frequencies after the episode, Tapio sent us some audio files of simulations he made in different concert halls. So we're going to listen to them now. In terms of concert halls, we have the Helsinki Music Italo, which is a vineyard-shaped concert hall. We have the Berlin Philharmonie Vineyard, the Vienna Music Verein, Shoebox Shape, and the Berlin Concert House, which is Shoebox Shape. So we're going to listen to different files and compare different acoustics of different halls. And we've got the bass, the crescendo and the distance. I'll listen to the files before. So there's differences I can hear with my headphones. And by the way, I advise you to have some fairly good headphones. But yeah, maybe you'll be able to hear some differences better than me. So let's play some files. So we start with the bass difference of the Helsinki Music Italo and Berlin Concert House. And if you remember, Tapio said that there's a better bass impression or bass content for the Berlin Concert House than the Helsinki Music Italo, because the Berlin Concert House is shoebox and Helsinki Music Italo is vineyard. So let's listen to Berlin Concert House. Okay, Helsinki. I can 
hear very small difference, but I'll play them again. So concert house here, there should be more bass. And now Helsinki. Hopefully it's clear, but you're welcome to listen to those samples again. And then we've got the question. So that's when I really struggled to hear it with my uh, headphones. So we've got Berlin Philharmonie versus Vienna Music Verein. And by the way, all the recordings you've listened to were 11 meters, if you want to know exactly what distance the microphone was from the, the stage. So we've got now, first of all, Berlin Philharmonie Vineyard Concert Hall. And we have the Vienna Music Verein. I think I can hear the difference now. Okay, so Berlin Philharmonie again. And then Vienna Music Verein. In the Vienna Music Verein, we should be able to hear better the crescendo, the, the difference between the pianissimo section and the crescendo until forte should be should be of a higher dynamic than the Berlin Philharmonie. We now have the distance. So the distance, there's two distance stairs, there's a distance uh, 11 meters away from the stage and 23 meters away from the stage in the Helsinki Musikatello and we have the same in the Berlin Concert House. So I'll play the two distances in the Berlin Concert House first. So this is 11 meters. And now 23 meters. And now we've got the Helsinki Musicatello, 11 meters. And now 23 meters. You can obviously hear the difference between 11 meters and 23 meters away. And it's much clearer at 11 meters from the stage, obviously. But let's compare. So Helsinki Musicatello and... Berlin Concert House at 23 meters. Berlin Concert House. And now we have the Helsinki Music Italo. In the Berlin Concert House, the acoustic of the orchestra or the music of the orchestra should be slightly clearer than the music is alone. It's it's just noticeable, but it's it's not extremely extremely obvious. So hopefully you'll be able to hear that and uh, in your headphones. And again, 
if you listen to that again, use some really good headphones. We'll carry on with the episode now. Where do you see the science of concert halls, acoustic, concert hall acoustics going? And what is there to improve still? I think it's kind of, uh, if you look at the research wise, and then uh, it's kind of, it has been separated a little bit like the acoustics on stage and acoustics in the hall. Kind of people are talking about stage acoustics and they are measured a little bit differently and then, then the whole acoustics, the acoustics on the audience. But I think that the, the modern design is, is kind of that we try to optimize both. There are historical, there are some halls that the sound is, is quite great in, in, in the audience part, but it's, it's really hard to play there because you don't, for example, hear each other on stage and the mutual communication is, is really bad. Or the other way around, that it's, it's really great on stage, but it's <laughs> quite mild and boring sound in the audience. And I think nowadays it's kind of the design is at least the best designers, they kind of value both and, and then you really try to optimize both. And there I think we need more understanding still that, that how to do good stages also so that the, the players have enough support from the acoustics and, and it's not too loud. That's also something which is nowadays a big issue because the orchestras are playing really high levels. The instruments are getting better and better Maybe not anymore, but if you compare a like hundred years back, then I think the, the levels of, of the states were like 10 to 20 dB down because of the brass instruments were, were not so good and, and you can play so loud. And that's kind of, that's something that you have to have like a good conditions for the orchestra so that they can play with good quality, loud enough, but still so that they, they don't have a hearing problems in a couple of years. Then kind of uh, like complete understanding of the, let's say. And then it, it comes to the visual aspects and then all new forms. That's quite sure that the architects, they don't want to copy some existing halls, even though we know that it's great acoustics in music Verein, for example. Nobody wants to design the copy of a music Verein. And then what we know about architects and, and which is good is also that, that we want to have like new architecture, a new kind of shapes. And now it's, it's with the computer-aided design, it's kind of it's easy to do curved surfaces, even double curved surfaces, whatever. And then we will see like really fancy new architecture. Then we still have to understand the acoustics. It's, it's not anymore like shoeboxes or surround halls, but it's everything in between. And there we need need more. But I think we have quite good understanding, like the perceptions that, that we know now that yeah, there have to be direct sound have to be quite clear, and then the reflections. Hopefully from the side, uh, maybe upwards from the side. But but there, for every seat, we have to have enough early reflections, and then also the reverb. What we what we do. Then I think more research is still used. Uh, a lot of acousticians they like numbers and these objective numbers, and they say that the other reversion time have to be two seconds or or clarity have to be such and such decibels, and they are usually talking about mid frequencies. The mid frequencies are the most boring ones. We should actually really concentrate much more on the really low frequencies and then also really high frequencies where you got the brightness. Because there are some halls where you just have like, when you hear it first time, then you realize that, okay, sometimes violins can be this bright and, and you have so rich sound from violins if you have enough brightness in a hall. So we should concentrate much more on, let's say, the extremes of the frequency range because that's that's where the differences are now. So there are there are many aspects uh, still to make research. And then, of course, all this research knowledge that, that is available nowadays, which is much more than, let's say, 20 years ago or 10 years ago, is that it should go to practice. As we know that, for example, school, like if you go out of concert halls and go just the normal schools, we all know that there are really bad classrooms. And it's, it's not the big science anymore. We know that, that you have to damp the ceiling and hopefully some walls and, and just take the reversion out. But still in practice, there are many new schools where there is not good room acoustics. So it's kind of taking the knowledge in the practice much more. I forgot to ask you about some research you've done about wood fiber pulp. When you, we spoke uh, the first time, it was quite interesting, not just the sound absorption and acoustic data, but 
what it would take to produce those sorts of materials. So yeah, yeah. So that that's kind of the new new research area where I'm going, uh, and and I have a couple of PhD students, and I'm working with a small Finnish company which is called Lumir. They are basically making uh, acoustic damping material out of cellulose because traditionally they are, as I think all of us know, that 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 they are like glass wool or rock wool, the acoustic tiles. Basically, it doesn't matter which are the fibers because the, the sound attenuation happen, happens in the pores between the fibers. So you have to have a porous material where you have tiny pores, optimally from 10 microns to a couple of hundreds of microns, maybe half a millimeter. Then they, they absorb sound. Basically, they transfer the sound energy to heat. Then there is a like new kind of environmental friendly option is, is one of them is cellulose, but of course there are other other biofibers as well. But we have been we have been uh, studying cellulose mainly uh, recently also I'm, I'm actually collaborating with pro- professor in chemistry and they are using bio waste. So so you can extract cellulose from and then also there are some studies on pectin based, so that can be from orange peels, <laughs> wherever. But the, the main idea there is that you have, for example, cellulose uh, fibers, and then you form them, as you do with the glass wool as well, the, the similar way. And then you form them, and then when it dries, it kept the poro structure. And then you have you can do acoustic tiles. This company actually have the main product is this kind of sprayable product. You can spray on any wall. And it attached to any wall. Then, when it dries, it keeps the porosity. Then you can do also curved surfaces and, and so on. And you can smooth it so when you look a little bit more far away, it looks really like a plaster concrete wall. And then, yeah, there is the environmental aspect is, is actually the main driving point why I'm interested in is that to do these products is is first of all they they bind carbon because they are natural fibers, so there's carbon included. But then you you also don't need high temperatures. So you can do, for example, this kind of acoustic tiles out of cellulose or pulp uh, in less than 100 degrees. So you don't need so much heat than, in, for example, in glass wool. You have to melt the glass to make the fibers out of that. And then uh, this company, actually, which I'm working with, uh, is, is they have a certificate that, that their products are carbon negative. So the whole production including transfer of the materials and everything, it's actually producing less carbon oxide that the whole product is binding. And of course, there is there are some, you can go, for example, class A easily, and, and you can have acoustic tile, which is class A. They resist the fire and they, they don't flame, but still with natural fibers, you cannot get class A, but your class B is, is at least in Finnish, Finnish standards, it's, it's okay. They, do and they resist the fire, but they don't, they still burn? So yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So they resist, and, and you can add add some chemicals there so that they they uh, quite well resist the fire. In in design, it's it's the usually in the buildings, it's kind of the the total fire load in a way. It depends what the other structures, if they are steel structures or something, and then you can put as much as that. But if if it's a wooden building or other other materials, they burn easily or more easily. Then then you need probably from acoustic materials. So. The first time I saw it was, um, and I heard about it, was you sharing a video of somebody burning, putting some flame on it, uh, and showing that it, it was really resistant. It was still I burned on some side, but it was really, really resistant to, to fire. Yeah, there's a, actually there is a small, really small, like two minute uh, YouTube video, which was made by the university because one of the university hall was was treated with this acoustic uh, sprayable coating uh, out of cellulose, and, and I can actually send you a link, and you can link it it here because then people can. That's kind of we made uh, in purpose so that it was it was before and after, so it was really reverberant space. Then I spoke and explained there, and you can really hear the reverb after the renovation, and then the. The, the good thing there is that you can actually color this, for example, because the pulp or the, the mass, you can do whatever colors. So it's kind of it's kind of invisible as, as of course, if you do acoustic tiles, but this kind of sprayable coating, it's, you can do it mostly invisible. You don't see it, but then it's kind of porous. It's sounding like the uh, episode is being pom- sponsored by Lumiere, but <laughs> it is not. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, it's, there's no it's worries not, about it. 
Maybe maybe we can ask sponsor, but it's kind of yeah, maybe. But we'll it's a, it's a small company, and then then it's there is many, and there are some other companies as well in in Finland which are now trying to develop. Uh, one of the one of the problems there is is still to to do the mass production. There are some techniques to do the mass production already, but it's it's really lack of kind of building the factories, and I think like the. The construction in industry is so so used to use glass wool or rock wool, and, and there are big big companies which are producing big factories which are producing. And of course, then it's they can put the price down, and then we still still need kind of the more development to do the mass production, and then also like to reduce the price and everything. But but I think that's that's future, as as we see in in all construction design is is that this kind of environmental aspects are more and more important. How to recycle. Uh, materials and, and these kind of things that's coming. When you demolish a building, can you repurpose it? Can you leave it on the landfill and it will be compostable? I, I think yes, yes, you can. You can actually because it's it's basically wood, so you can you can you can put it in landfills. Maybe even reuse it to some extent, but of course it depends that how it's attached to some other materials and how easily you can extract it when you demolish a building, for example. And can you replace mineral wool uh, or rock wool with it uh, as an insulation between uh, in metal frame uh, structures or as, as linings, if you see what I mean, in cavities, yeah, when you put insulation uh, in cavities, uh, does think, it have all the resistance to to replace it? Yeah, I think, why not? And they actually, uh, because they're natural fibers, they take more moisture inside then it's also that if, if you have a little bit of ventilation there they also also leave the water out so that that we know that if, if the glass wool gets wet then it's, it's really hard to dry but then those natural fibers they actually they take easy, more easily the water in but then also, also they they kind of give the water out because they are still still and, and, and our recent results which we are now writing a paper is is that that when there is Quite a lot of moisture there. It's actually they absorb a little bit more sound. So it's kind of even the fibers are swelling or they they get a little bit flexible and they are bending a little bit and that's kind of why they absorb more sound. It's 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 not much, but it's kind of five percent more and also at low frequencies. Is it more expensive than any standard materials? Uh, yeah, so far yes. it's it's more expensive, but I think it's 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 mainly because of the um, uh, kind of lack of mass production. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other than that, like the, the raw material is, is, is cheap, so it's it's when the when the when the production techniques gets better and, and then you have a bigger quantities, then then I think there is no reason that why it should be more expensive. So last questions um, that I to finish the episode, and well, you know about them, but um, if you had to travel uh, fifty years ahead. How do you think the new new concert halls will look like and will be like? Definitely, there will be some some new architecture, but I think it's kind of we are not seeing so big differences because uh, the size of the hall we don't want to go more than two thousand people probably because then by fact some of the audience members are so far away that they don't see anymore well what happens on stage and then then you have to introduce a screens and some that's ha- what happens in pop music when you go to stadiums and there are rock concerts and then then because you don't see anymore what happens on stage that's why you have a big screens which are actually shooting you the, the <laughs> and, and then there you and basically you go there to be in a, in a big crowd of people and you are watching TV that's what happens so and I think that's that's not what we will do in concert halls but then this kind of variability of halls, uh, I think if I could predict, I will say that, that the electronic or the kind of the reverberation enhancement systems will be standards in every hall because we want to do really multi-purpose halls, especially in, in countries like Finland, which are towns are quite small. So we cannot afford to do the hall only for acoustic music. In every Finnish hall, there is always... Sometimes there are rock bands, but there are amplified music in any case. There are congresses whatsoever so they have to cope with all kind of situations and, and have a really variable acoustics and I think that will be the easiest and the best solutions will be like reverberation enhancement systems 
nowadays we are still doing passive means like using a lot of curtains and and maybe like turnable wall elements or something. I think that's still probably in UK the kind of the what people are doing. Mainly curtains, I think, is is kind of the kind of do more damping if needed for the amplified ones. But I think the the reverberation enhancement systems will be kind of the future because the best of them actually sound pretty good already. It's only a matter of time that they are more accepted because then it's, it's, it's much more easier from the design point of view to design the whole so that it's already in the design plan is that, okay, there will be a reverberation enhancement system and then you can design the room acoustic to be quite neutral and then you add something with, with uh, kind of artificial reverb. Nowadays, one of the problems is nowadays that many of the bad holes, they try to improve with reverberation enhancement. But then the problem is that the sound of the hole is actually bad already. <laughs> Maybe there are some problems with the frequency response or there is some reverberation that, that you can get rid of. On top of that, you try to build something and of course, it's not optimal situation. So that's something what I what I foresee. But I, as I said, I, I don't see like going to much bigger holes because then you are just too far away and you cannot see anymore what, what happens on stage. Can you give us some examples of halls that have those um, electroacoustic systems? We have one one hall in in Finland. Uh, it's in Turku, which is a city in the southern part of Finland. And there, it's actually an old factory hall. I think so. They have also like movable audience area, so that it can be from five hundred to three thousand five hundred people, and it's mainly used for for amplified music. But there is a uh, reverberation enhancement system that is it's actually working quite nicely. But there the fact is that that because when it was renovated, the, the old kind of the factory hall, then there is lot quite a lot of damping. So it's kind of I think even though it's a big hall, I think the reverberation time is something like one or one point two when the reverberation enhancement is not working and it's quite flat, the frequency response. And there, it's kind of the neutral situation, quite dry in the beginning, and then you can add the reverberation enhancement there. But there are not so many classical concerts, but it's more like amplified, other amplified music events. But then still they use it quite a lot. And then then I've heard some experimental ones that we have done. We have actually done one rock club in, in Helsinki where it's, it's only for 200 people, but there is a reverberation enhancement system because sometimes there is also like jazz or word music or string quartet playing. And then they are using that and they say that, yeah, it's actually really nice that you can play in small clubs also, like rock clubs, but still they can be a string quartet and, and then then you have kind of surrounding sound because you have the reverberation. I'll have to go there one day. Yeah, yeah, you have to go. There is, it's actually an interesting place because there is also a distributed sound system. So there is, there is a PA, but the idea is that, that the PA is not run really loud because there's kind of fill-ins, delayed fill-ins later on so that you can... The idea was that that you have hi-fi sound everywhere, and then it's working surprisingly good. What's your favorite concert hall? You can give it a, f- a couple or a few if you want. Uh, yeah, yeah. I really like Musikverein in Vienna, but there you have to be like quite front. If you are like from midway to back, then it's kind of only nice reverb, but then you lose the, the crispiness and the clarity of the hall. I recently uh, visited Stavanger, which is in Norway. That's kind of 10 years old hall, and, and that was actually part there. It was really good. There you have the like the huge clarity, but then kind of the responsiveness of the of the loud playing and, and the envelopment was still there. And then even in, in when Douglas was playing forte, then you, you kind of hear really well the different instruments and so on. That's kind of the modern halls that, that I like. But then also what the, and the European halls like Berlin Concert House. So the shoebox hall in Berlin is kind of also one of my favorites. Is there any concert halls you haven't been to and you'd like to go to? Yes, in uh, the KKL in Luzern. There I have never been. And then uh, then one interesting is is that is the Christchurch Christ Church in New Zealand, because that's kind of if you go to acoustic conf- conferences, it's always mentioned as, as one of the best halls, and it's quite different than the others. But then uh, there are quite <laughs> quite few people who have been there because it's in New Zealand. That's why I, I actually like to go there and, and, and hear it by myself, because now I'm 
I've, I've been told so many stories why how good it is and, and so on, but then I've never been there, so I cannot. And, and based on the drawings and everything, there are some some things that I, I don't know if they how they work, and that that would be actually really nice to to kind of visit. And then in Europe, I have been quite many halls, and in Boston, I have been in Boston Symphony Hall. That was really good. And then maybe Walt Disney Hall because that's also in in Los Angeles. There have been never been, so maybe that that might be also interesting. Great, thank you uh, very much, Tapio. How do we, um, if people want to get in touch or ask you any questions, uh, do they? Yeah, I think the easiest easiest way is to, is to reach me by email. You can find it by googling my name. There's the email is, is many places. It's alta.fi, my, my name, and alta.fi. And then, uh, if you want to follow my research, it's kind of. Basically, LinkedIn is, is actually good. There I try to post kind of uh, recent papers. And then, then of course, my website, is, is which you can Google easily. There's the publications. I, I keep that updated all the time. Alto Acoustics Lab is actually in Instagram. So we have Alto Acoustics Lab, everything that's in Instagram. And then, then you can see also what, the, what else is, is done in Alto. Uh, in, in in our acoustics department, so that's probably the best way of, of following what's happening here, like also other other research. Great. Well, thank you again, Tapio, and um, You're welcome. I'll see you later. It's a pleasure to be be here and discuss interesting topics.